it's my great pleasure to introduce our Mill Talk speaker tonight. Um, this is sponsored by a grant from the Waltham Cultural Council. John J. Colony III, or Chick Colony, as he likes to be called, is a fifth generation in his family involved in textiles and is the president of Harrisville Designs Incorporated in Harrisville, New Hampshire, having founded it in 1971. Chick served three years in the US Coast Guard in New Orleans, Louisiana. He studied six months at Columbia University in business school and graduated from Harvard College in 1967 with a concentration in English literature. He served as moderator of the town of Harrisville in New Hampshire for 40 years. And I'd like to welcome Chick Connolly. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. And <clears throat> I want to also congratulate the Boston Weavers Guild on the 100 years. It's pretty incredible when you think about it. Um, Harrisville Designs is only 50 years old, and I thought that was old. We're only halfway. <laughs> on the way down here, I was thinking about uh, another title for this talk, maybe how did I get into this mess anyway? <laughs> it's kind of a long story. Let, let me begin by saying Harrisville is a small village in Cheshire County. It's between Keene and Peterborough. And uh, my family moved there in 1849 when they purchased the mill from the Harris family who established the village. And for some reason, uh, they kept the thing, the mill going uh, up until 1970, and the 20th century missed Harrisville completely. So when the mill closed finally in 1970, it was pretty much intact the way it had been built by the Harrises in the 1840s and 50s. Um, it's a National Historic Landmark now, uh, not because of what it is, but because it survived. There, was, there were probably 300 villages like Harrisville in New England and this is the only one that seemed to have survived and uh, intact. And it was considered uh, an important place because of what it was. Not, it wasn't important because it was built, it was important because it, it pers persevered. In 1970, um, the situation in textiles, especially in New England, was grim. Um, my father told me that when World War II ended, uh, one way to measure the textile industry and the woolen industry was the number of broad looms running in the country. And in 1945, there were 90,000 broad looms running in this country. In 1970, there were fewer than 4,000. So in those 25 years, they went from 90,000 to 4,000. Basically, the industry disappeared, not just down south, but completely away. In 1970, 54 mills in New England closed. And there may have been some right down here that were operating at that time. Uh, my family's company was called the Cheshire Mills. It was a medium-sized mill, had 40 looms, about 125 employees. And it was, a, uh, as Bob said, a fully integrated woolen mill, which means that they purchased wool and they produced cloth for women's wear in the garment industry. Uh, I was in the Coast Guard in New Orleans for th three years, and if you've, if you've never visited New Orleans, I would recommend it. It's a great place to visit, and it's a terrible place to live. Um, it's difficult to live down there, but it was, it was great. For me, it was, I always think of it as better than Vietnam, because some of my friends weren't quite so lucky. But I learned a lot in New Orleans. One was, there are many old buildings that to appreciate there, and I learned to love them over the three years. And the last year I was there, Marriott Hotels decided to build a large hotel in the French Quarter, next to where I was working. And I watched them tear down an entire block of the French Quarter 
to build this gigantic Marriott Hotel so people could come and stay in the hotel and see the French Quarter, which they had just torn down. Um, so it was a real lesson in you know, how not to do preservation. Um, the mill in Harrisville closed in 1970. I was still on active duty. Uh, I was at the 8th Coast Guard District Headquarters. I went to see my boss, who was an admiral, and asked him if I could be released early to go home and help my father and his brother wind down the business. And I was due to leave the Coast Guard within a couple of months anyway, and he gave me permission to leave early. So I get, ended up back in Harrisville in December of 1970. The mill closed in October. And it was pretty, pretty quiet, and uh, nobody really knew what the future was going to be like. Um, a number of people got together, and we used to sit around and talk about how do we preserve this place? What is it going to become? It's always been a textile village. Everybody there was somehow connected to the mill, but uh, the future was going to be different. People who lived in the town, many of them thought the mill would open again because it always had, but we knew it wasn't going to open again. Um, about half the people in the village didn't even own cars because you could do everything in a, a small village, an industrial village, is like a miniature city. You can go to work there, you go to school there, you shop there, you can recreate. You don't have to get in a car for anything. And uh, half the people there uh, didn't have cars. My parents were friendly with uh, Abbott Cummings, who at the time was director for Society for Preservation of New England Antiquities, which we now know as Historic New England. And Abbott uh, was one of those people who really appreciated Harrisville and urged them to try to get a group together to plan on what, you know, what actually might happen. And uh, what we figured out right away was we didn't have any money to do anything. And somehow, if we were going to save this place, it had to, it had to contribute to its own savings. So th this sounds obvious now to reuse an industrial building. I mean, we're surrounded by beautiful industrial buildings here that are apartments and everything else. But in 1970, nobody really had thought to do that. Um, but we decided that the only way we could do it was if we used the buildings in modern ways without damaging their historic characteristics. So we started Historic Harrisville in the spring of 1971. And one of the things that seemed to be at risk was the possibility that there would be any textiles in this place in the future. And uh, I wasn't sure what I was gonna do. I wasn't gonna go back in the military. I definitely wasn't gonna go back to business school, which, another whole story. Um, so, I decided uh, it might be nice to start a business that would continue some textiles in the village. You can imagine what my father and his brother thought of this idea, having just ended one themselves, but I decided I would do it, and I set up the business Harrisville Designs separate from historic Harrisville. So we all, it's a small town, we all wear many hats. I'm on the board of historic Harrisville, but I'm also a tenant of historic Harrisville and I run the business to do that. And uh, having gone to business school, I, I wasn't sure, I, I knew I didn't want to get anywhere near a business. I did, it didn't make any sense to me just to make a lot of effort to make money. I, it didn't, I needed more than that. And so sustaining a textile industry for preservation reasons appealed to me a lot more than just starting a business. So I'm sure in 1971 I started the only uh, woolen mill in the United States, <laughs> and uh, it's still going after 50 years. Um, as I got it started, uh, I, I was um, I, I had an uncle, a separate uncle from textiles, who ran a business in Keene. He was my mentor, and uh, after a couple of months of running it, I said to him, "It's really funny." Uh, I didn't think you could just start a business. I mean, think about it for a minute. How do you start a business? You ask people on the street to come in and work and you're gonna pay them? And there would seem to be no constraints in doing that. Uh, I had a friend who was a lawyer and I said, as soon as I started the business, the government unloaded paperwork on me like you wouldn't believe. You know, how many trucks come to your business in a day and where do they go and how much do you pay them and where do they come from, that kind of thing. And I said, I can't run a business and fill out all these forms. What should I do? And he said, what's your bottom line? 
And I said, my bottom line is I don't want to go to jail. And he said, well, you need to withhold taxes on your employees and you need to pay that withholding to the government. If you do that, they won't throw you in jail. They'll be mad at you because you're not doing anything else and they're gonna write you mean letters, but they're not gonna put you in jail. But you cannot hold those taxes back and keep them. So that's how I started and I told my uncle how strange it was and he said to me, that is the essence of what we have in this country and it's what we call free enterprise. And free enterprise literally means you have the freedom to enter in, in, a, in an enterprise. He said, if you were in France and you were starting this woolen mill, you would have to get permission from all the other woolen mills in France, and they would have a year to comment on your application. And you can't get in without their permission. And he said, that's why our economy is so strong, because we do have this free enterprise, and crazy people like yourself can start things, and who knows where they go from there. Uh, so I that was a good lesson for me at that point. I got help from the Boston Weavers Guild almost right away. One of our neighbors in Hancock, New Hampshire, was Mary Merrill. And Mary at the time was the president of the Boston Weavers Guild. And she knew what we were trying to do in Harrisville. And she encouraged me to go to the New England Weavers Seminar, which the guild was involved in holding in Amherst. This is in the summer of 1971, six months after I got out of the military. And Mary, in Amherst, re, uh, uh, introduced me to Nell Zamorowski. And Nell was a designer working at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York, but she was also very famous in the hand weaving world, having written a book called Step by Step Weaving. Step by Step Weaving was a golden book, and it came out just as weaving was beginning to get going in the 1970s. And uh, so Nell got interested in what we were doing and offered to help be the color designer for Harrisville Designs. So starting in that, that summer, 1971, she uh, worked with us on our colors so that we weren't just totally random making colors and hoping people would like them. Uh, Harrisville Designs began as a yarn making business. I looked at the possibility of staying fully integrated, that is to say making cloth, but the Steps of making cloth are very complicated and it's difficult to do it on a small scale. But I thought we could spin on a small scale. And that's basically what we tried to do is to stay small. It actually returned us to the early days of textiles because when textiles was first being built in this country, the weaving was the last thing that came into the mills. The mills began by making yarn and giving it to the weavers who wove at home. So before 18, 25, many of the country mills just made yarn. So we went back to that idea. Over the years, Harrisville Designs changed, um, still stuck with our mission of uh, trying to sustain the textiles there. Uh, in 1972, we decided that we needed to make a loom because I remembered from business school the razor and razor blade thing. And I thought, well, I mean, think of the loom as the razor and the yarn is the blades, that's what gets consumed. And my si I have five sisters and they were all looking to buy a loom at the time and I looked around and I thought, boy, this is hard to find. So I looked into it a little more and I thought, well, looms are expensive to make, no wonder they're expensive to buy. Um, so I came up with the idea of making the looms as kits. So we make a loom 22 inch, 36 inch, 40 inch, whatever, and we sell it as a kit and so the person who buys it from us puts it together themselves and it is a tool and it works well as a kit because they're not intimidated by it and they can repair it and change it and use it as they want. So in 1972 we became a loom company also and we're still the only company that makes yarn and looms. Uh, most companies either make looms or make yarn. Um, I think it makes us a better company because uh, we know where the yarn's going and we know what the looms are for. Uh, in 1978 uh, I st when I started the business, we sold all the yarn directly to people. So you, you could write to us, like Beth she would write, and we'd send her a couple of cones of yarn in the mail, and that was the mail order business. But there were many weaving stores starting at the time, and they wanted to buy our yarn and sell it in the stores. So we developed, we switched the business over to wholesale. 
that sounds complicated. It isn't really. You just double your prices one day and discount them 50% and keep on going. <laughs> and so we did that, and we sold twice as much yarn right away because stores could actually deliver a service that we couldn't. Uh, the business continued along. I never hired a business consultant because I knew what they would tell me. The loom business was a, a good business. You, you design a loom, you make it, you figure out what it costs to make it. You set the price, you go in the market, people pay it. But with the yarn, you do all those steps, and you go into the market, nobody's going to pay you that much. Um, so we, we j just had to keep, the looms had to support the yarn for a long time. Um, in 19, about 19... Uh, 80, we, we found out many of the people buying our yarns were actually knitting with it. And it was not quite soft enough for knitting. They wanted to soften it up. So we used, instead of using just 100% New Zealand wool, we added New, uh, Australian wool to it to make it softer. And it still had to be strong enough to be a weaving yarn. And so that changed the yarn a little bit. In 1985, the weaving industry collapsed. And uh, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but many of our customers, most of our customers were women. In 1985, many of the women had to stop doing what they were doing at home and go to work. And so the industry kind of slowed down fast. And we, we thought it would come back. It, it really has yet to come back the way it was. But we went to look at places, we wanted to stay in the weaving business, so we looked at places where we had not delivered the kind of product the customers were asking for. And one of the main areas for that was for, for children. Because when a, a, a school wanted to teach weaving before 1985, we would tell them, you need to buy 15 of these looms, cost you this much money, you have to have a teacher who knows how to use them, kids won't share them, a pretty serious investment for a school. Many schools did it, many didn't, uh, but we, we went back and looked and realized we needed to come up with products that didn't require a lot of instruction, that the teacher wasn't, teachers were overwhelmed and they didn't have to become a weaver to be able to convey, you know, what we were selling. So we started making uh, what we called friendly loom products for children. And to the, today, that is about half of our business. There's, we think of them as educational toys to teach children about fiber arts. So dyeing, felting, knitting, crochet, weaving, potholders. <laughs> uh, we got into the potholder business because our toy reps wanted us to, uh, they, they, we all, we have to admit, we all made potholders when we were kids. And the potholder loops, it's an interesting story, the loops came from the sock industry. So socks were knitted as a cylinder and when the toe was sewed closed, they cut it and the loop fell on the floor. And someone picked it up and said, I can do something with these. And that's where the pothole of looms came from. As the sock industry went to synthetic yarn and offshore, the loops, the quality of the loops fell apart. So synthetic yarns are stretchy and the potholes were coming out this big instead of six by six. And uh, we st just jumped into the industry, bought some looms from somebody, bought waist loops, and we were having so many problems with the loops because of their poor quality that we decided we had to either get out of the business or fix the problem. And so I decided I would find better loops, better quality, like we remembered as kids. So I traveled around some. I went offshore, Guatemala, China, places that were making socks. And it turns out that the modern sock knitting industry has developed machinery that knits the toe closed. There are no more loops. And I thought, well, this is bad. Uh, so I actually went down south and found somebody who could knit the loops for us. So that instead of knitting a sleeve for a sock, they would knit just a loop and it would fall on the floor. And so we took a waste product and replaced it with a manufactured product, which in business school would tell you, do not do that. <laughs> but it was the only way we could maintain any quality. Um, so we did that, and I'm glad we did because, well, to give you an idea, we sell a bag of loops for making potholders. Beth has some here with her. Uh, we sell a bag for $20 retail, and everybody else sells the same size bag for $4, and ours is way better value. And in the toy industry, everybody told me, you can't do that. You're not gonna, it's not going to happen. But 
we can do it. We're a small company and not everybody buys our loops, but the people who want good loops do. And everything was going along fine and then the pandemic came on in 2020 and two things happened that fell directly into our laps. One is the schools closed and the second is Amazon didn't close. And so all of a sudden, everything took off. I mean, as I said, we're a small company, so we don't have to have much business to be busy, but we really had a boom during the pandemic, uh, thanks to those two things, because not all parents were happy with their children staring at screens all day, and they wanted them to do things with their hands. So we've had um, an interesting time since the pandemic came, um, and it's, Surprised the daylights out of me because I never thought we'd ever make any money running Harrisville Designs, but we actually could make a little bit of money during the pandemic. And in, I don't, I'm sure it's the same here in New Hampshire. Businesses either did really well during the pandemic, like Harrisville Designs, or they did very, very badly. And there was nothing much in between. Um, so we were lucky. Um, you can't, if you're a manufacturing company, you can't have your employees go home and do it on a screen. They have to be there at the machine doing it. And uh, we had employees who were willing to come to work. We were very well spread out. We had a high protocols. We were very cautious and uh, we got through it in really good shape. Um, even though some of the employees could have made more money staying home, but they didn't want to do that and they stayed with us. So today, Harrisville Designs um, is 35 employees. I didn't introduce my wife, Pat. She's right here. And she's not only my life partner, but also my business partner because we worked together uh, for 45 or 47 of the 50 years. A and uh, it, it's really been a great, uh, great thing for both of us. Uh, not easy to do it all the times, but you, share, you can share a lot. Uh, our, our children, I mean, if, you think, if you think about a business being part of preservation, it has to go on. It can't, it can't be a business that I could sell to somebody. And I get offers to buy the business all the time. I can't sell it to someone and have them move it away. Um, I can't close it because if I did, it would detract from the preservation. Uh, so it was really important that somebody come along after us. And we have three sons. And when they got out of college, their attitude about the business was, this looks like a lot of work and not much money. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that is pretty accurate, actually. <laughs> but there's a lot more to it, and there's a lot more you get out of it, which is a little more sophisticated and it takes time to understand. But luckily for us, uh, two of our sons are working in the business, and one of them, Nick, is sort of taking it over. He lived here in Boston for four years and worked for a company down here, and then he decided to give it a shot. And so in 19 and 20, 10 or 2011, he came up and started working in the business. And he's still working in the business and he's really good at it, lucky for us. And he brings a lot of modern things to the business, which we didn't have, like the internet, <laughs> which I, we, I was ignoring. But uh, he's really uh, brought, brought that into our business and it's made a huge difference. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Amazon, but everybody who sells on Amazon should be careful how I say that. The guy went into space, and 28 million people were hoping he'd blow up. <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's true. <laughs> They're very difficult to work with, mainly because there are very few people there, and they never make a mistake. So everything that goes wrong is your fault, and you're paying for it. Uh, so it's frustrating, and, and, uh, but we, I'm happy to say, on our own website, sell as much material as Amazon does on theirs. So that makes us feel good. Um, Nick decided uh, that he, our spinning mill was operating in a building separate from the old buildings, because in 1977, we got thrown out of the old mill where we were by the company who owned it at the time, and we built a building in the old freight yard of the railroad. Imagine a building that looks like a hockey rink and inside is the spinning equipment. And Nick decided he wanted to move it back to the old mill buildings where we originally were. And I told him I was 76 and he should just wait a few years and do whatever he wants and <laughs> leave me out of it. But he said, no, I want to move, him, move it now. 
And I said, why do you want to move it? And he said, I want to get as many employees under one roof as possible, but I also want to make the yarn with renewable energy. And the, and the mill where we're tenants it has water power producing electricity. And Nick decided he could put a solar array on top of one of the mills. It's, the mill we're in is a flat roof mill of 10,000 square feet. And the, and the uh, roof is f relatively flat and has a parapet around it. And he put 189 panels up there last spring, and you can't see them anywhere. I mean, if you're putting 189 panels in the middle of a National Historic Landmark, you've got to be careful. But he, he was convinced he could do it, and uh, they're installed, and it's actually working. And the solar is a good match with the water power because the solar is basically a summer event, and the water power is basically a winter event. Don't ask me where the water comes from in the winter. I still haven't figured that out, but we have a lot of water in December, January, February, and March. So we are making yarn now entirely with renewable energy. Now, it's complicated. You know, all that energy goes onto the grid, and then you buy electricity back, and you try to even it out. But it's, a, it's, uh, it's what he really wanted to do, and it feels right to be doing it, and our customers are very supportive of the idea. Um, so we're really happy that that's happening. And it wouldn't have happened if Nick hadn't come along and insisted on it. Um, textiles have changed, though. To, uh, I probably shouldn't tell this story, but I moved the textile equipment that we have twice before. So it's been moved three times. Once it was relocated in the building uh, where it originally was. Then we re relocated it in 1977 to this modern hockey rink building we built. And uh, we had to move it back. So when he said he wanted to move it, I said, well, he I said, what's it going to cost to move this equipment? And I said, well, it's pretty expensive. Let me look. I, can't, I keep everything. I had my file from 1977, pulled it out. I said, 1977, it cost $8,000 to move all this equipment. I went online, $8,000 today is worth $35,000. So I said, you better plan forty to 50000 to move it. So we called up the same company that moved it for us in 1977. I said, I'm, here I am again. I want to move it again. The same equipment from point A to point B we moved. Now we're going from B back to A. And uh, I said, can you give an, es an estimate? And they came back with the estimate, $175,000. And I called them and I said, you got us mixed up with somebody else. This can't be our job. And they said, it is. And I thought about this a lot. I didn't, we didn't do it for 175000 I found some other riggers in Maine who would do it on a cost-plus basis, and it was much cheaper than that. But I think in the old days, and 1977 was the old days, there were companies who moved entire plants, and so they knew how to do that in, in large volume, and they don't do that anymore because there are, I'm thinking I'm one of the few experts in moving textile equipment in New Hampshire, in New England still. And I think what they do now is they charge per machine. So instead of moving this whole room of machinery to another building, they move one machine, and then that machine. And each machine has a set price. And when you add them all up, it's astronomical. Uh, so that was one major change. Harrisville Designs today, uh, we're still making yarn. There are a couple of other companies in New England still making yarn, but not very many. And it's really, uh, it's hard to believe that uh, an industry that almost all our grandparents worked in. I mean, 1965, textiles was the biggest industry in New Hampshire. Everybody was associated with it. And now it's virtually gone. Um, and there used to be 10 woolen mills within 10 miles of Harrisville. Now there's, there are none. Um, so, and the whole infrastructure has, has collapsed. Uh, I, I, a salesman, an old-fashioned salesman used to call me, selling me belting like they see hanging off the walls here. <clears throat> and his name was um, John Moore, and he represented a company. And he was old-fashioned salesman. He, he, he would come in with a pad of paper with his name on it and a couple of pens and give them to me, even though I didn't buy any belting because it was so small. And then he t was telling me that when he first started in the industry, he would go to the Hanover Inn check into the inn, and work for three weeks out of the inn, visiting all the mills around Hanover. And then he would go to Maine and do the same thing. And at that point, this was 1978 or 9, he said he only had one customer left in Maine. 
and very few left in New Hampshire. So the industry really has uh, gone away. Um, now, this is, this is not a work that everybody can do. I mean, you, I couldn't have all of you come into the spinning mill and make yarn. It takes a long time. Some of the skilled jobs take a year to learn. And uh, that's part of the problems with textiles. It, it does require a lot of handwork. It's physical. It's dirty. Um, people love it. Some people love it. Uh, not everybody. Um, but, uh, you know, keeping those employees coming, that's going to be Nick's biggest job going forward, is keeping people interested and trained. And you have to pay competitive wages, of course. So uh, there are some challenges. It's been a lot of fun doing it. Um, I, I've been kind of wandering all over here, but uh, what I thought I would do is I'll show you a little video of the business. If you go online, you'll see this video and another one. Uh, and then I'll take questions and answers if you have any, because maybe I haven't touched on some things. Architectural historian William Pearson had it right when he wrote, Today throughout our country, the machine tears away incessantly at nature. But in Harrisville, the stream continues to flow as a perpetual reminder of those brief but exciting years when the machine and nature were working as one. Welcome to Harrisville Designs, where we design and manufacture yarns and handmade tools for fiber crafts. We carry on a textile tradition that began here over 200 years ago. It's a family tradition that's been passed from hand to hand, stubbornly and proudly at the same time. We're proud of our products, entirely American made, right here in New Hampshire. They can't get much more local than that. For over two centuries, we lived and breathed fiber crafts every day. We are a community of knitters, weavers, spinners, and felters. Fiber is what we do. Before it reaches you, each pound of wool or piece of wood used in our products is touched by human hands. We believe that the love that we put into our products and the sense of place that defines them is what makes them different. We know that you'll love them as much as we do. Let, let me say a little, before I turn it over to questions, let me say a little bit more about the machinery. Textile machinery in New, in New England basically came from one of two places, North Andover, which is where the Davis and Ferber machine works were, and Whitensville, which is where the Whitensville machine works were. And mills tended to be all of one or the other. The machines you saw in these pictures were purchased by my grandfather in the 1920s from Davis and Ferber in North Andover. And the newest machines were from 1960. They were also from North Andover. That company closed in 1971, I think. Um, it's a little embarrassing to be running equipment that's almost 100 years old. I mean, these machines over here don't look old fashioned to me. <laughs> and the cards that we run were built in 1924 in North Andover. They've never been anywhere but in Harrisville and they're gonna turn 100 years old in a year. But they still work and they still make yarn. The, the Industrial Revolution was basically focused on the problem of how do we make hand spun yarn smoother and faster. And that's really what the textile industry did, and that's what the Industrial Revolution was all about. By 1900, pretty much all the technology was there. Um, about 15 years ago, a guy called me from, I don't know where he was from, but he's, he asked me what we were running for cards, and I told him. And he said, what do they produce, about 50 pounds an hour? And I said, on good days when the sun's sunshiny, yeah. And he said, well, I import a card from Italy that will double your production, 100 pounds an hour. And I said, really? What does it cost? $4 million. <laughs> the, the cards we have are worthless. If we, clo if we close the business tomorrow, they go to the dump. Nobody wants them. You can't replace that kind of equipment with $4 million. Uh, I told this story one time to a group of people, and I said, nobody but the World Bank would be dumb enough to do that. And one woman raised her hand and said, I work for the World Bank. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. There are 5,000 woolen mills in China running today, and some of those have those $4 million cards. I won't tell you who paid for them, but they're there and they're running. But that's really the problem. It's, yeah, so it's a little embarrassing to have 100-year-old machinery, but it, it's very practical because, I mean, why would you replace it? Um, we bought a new machine this year when we made the move because uh, I couldn't find a used one. 
much of the machinery uh, that, that disappeared in the 1970s and 80s was destroyed, so it's not there anymore. Um, so we had to buy a machine made in Germany that does a reeling, it's a reeling machine, and it's very nice, but it was very expensive. Um, but anyway, that's but, uh, Nick's problem, not mine. How about questions? I, I can't see very well, but it, I'm happy to try questions or talk about anything I haven't covered. You mentioned a reeling machine. What other machines do you have? What are the different things they do as the wool comes in and goes from raw to spun? Okay, yeah, the process is simple. It, you first have to blend or pick the wool. It, we buy the wool cleaned and dyed because we make all our yarns are dyed in the wool, which means they, we dye it first and then mix the colors. So the blending is, uh, is called picking. It's opening the wool. It doesn't break the fiber, but it just teases it like you would do when you're hand spinning. The second process is the carding of the wool, which is those big machines you saw look like paper making machines. And then after that, it goes onto a spinning frame. And those spinning frames, frames were developed in the cotton industry and they didn't come to the woolen industry until about 1935. Before that, they were spinning mules, which were derived from spinning jennies, those machines that traveled back and forth. And these buildings had those kind of machines. Um, and after it comes off the spinning frame, it's finished yarn, and everything after that is packaging. So we either cone it or reel it or ball it or whatever we're doing. In, in the case of knitting yarns, we wash it too so that we can wash off the spinning oil. But those are the steps, picking, carding, spinning. Is the yarn still from New Zealand and Australia? I beg your pardon? Is the wool you use still from New Zealand and Australia? The wool we use is mainly from, 80% of the wool in the world comes from Australia and New Zealand. And uh, there are lots of wools available. Uh, making yarn is like cooking. You, what you get, it depends on what you put into it. And in our case, because we dye the wool first, we needed a very white wool, because you can't dye wool brighter than it is. And when you're, when you're mixing colors together, a funny thing happens, they get darker and darker. So if you, if you want to make a teal out of a beautiful navy and a beautiful green, you get a very ugly teal. But if you make it out of a very bright green and a very outrageously bright navy, you get a really beautiful teal. So you can't dye wool brighter than it is. So as an example, you can't dye black wool pink, obviously. So we chose a wool in New Zealand that is very white. It's not bleached, it's naturally very white. And it's the same wool, incidentally, that's used to make, or used to be used to making tennis balls in this country. Tennis balls are 80% wool, 20% nylon, and uh, for the same reasons. And then when we softened the yarn up, as I mentioned in 1980, we introduced uh, 30 or 40% of an Australian wool, which is finer, uh, to give it the hand. So those are the two wools that we use. And they're not necessarily better than wools that are raised right here in New England. It's just that for our purposes, they're better. Um, so that's why we do that. And we, we're, we're trying to make a very consistent product so that if you buy yarn from us today, it's the same yarn you bought 15 years ago. And so that wool is always available. The price goes up and down, but it's always available. So can you talk a little bit about, it sounds like you're using the same or very similar equipment to what was used um, by your family, um, but you're making um, yarn that's used for hand weaving. It, was there anything that you changed about the yarn? Yeah, uh, textiles is a very competitive industry and the cost of the fiber going in was critical to the cost of the cloth coming out. So. When we got into the hand weaving business, we wanted the very best quality yarn we could make, and that meant the best quality wool we could buy. And you didn't mix 20% of nylon in with it or 20% of reused wool in with it. And so the, the kind of yarns we were making were the kind of yarns they made you know, back during the Civil War and, bef and the late 19th century. Very good quality uh, wool making very good quality yarn. Um, the last series of, the last uh, yarn, uh, cloth that the Cheshire Mills made, my family's business, was during the 1960s. They made cloth for Villager and Jonathan, John Meyer of Norwich. I don't know if you remember that, anybody's, 
but they were making sweaters and skirts that matched, and they were very popular, and they made the material for the skirts in Harrisville. But it was half reused wool. It wasn't very a good product, but it was, wasn't considered a cheap product in the market. In fact, it was considered an expensive product in the market. But uh, that's, what in, that's what textiles had to do. They had to always you know, watch what they, were, what they were putting into the blend. So we, we, we get to use 100% virgin wool at all times. We never do anything reused. So that's a big difference. But the machines are the same. The thing about the machines is they don't care what they're making. I mean, people think that the textile industry went out of business because of synthetics. But the machines don't care whether they're making 100% wool, 100% acrylic, or 100% polyester. It's the same process. It's just different fiber it's doing it to. But the reason you see nylon in everything was you can put 20% of nylon in basically anything and make yarn. And that's why the industry likes it. It's hard to buy carpet that's 100% wool. It's always a little bit of nylon in it. So there was no need to adapt the actual machines? No. No, they were, they were fine the way they were. Mm -hmm. I mean, you always adjust the machines depending on the size of the yarn you're making, but you didn't have yeah. to adjust much to, for what we were making. We have made 100% alpaca yarn before, and that's a, quite a bit of adjustment. But the s same machines will do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you ever offer any uh, tours of the mills where you're uh, manufacturing <laughs> the, the yarn? We, we do, yeah. Um, part of the reason Nick wanted to move the mill back, it was about an eighth of a mile away. And to get to it, you had to get in a car and drive to see it. By having it much closer, it's very close to our retail store now. Uh, so if you're up there, you can go to the retail store and ask to see the spinning mill. We're, we're going to do that. But uh, yes, eventually. We're not doing it yet because he hasn't announced that we've moved yet, although we didn't. We've been making yarn now for about eight weeks in the new location, but he hasn't announced it yet, so he doesn't want anybody to see it because people go in with their cell phones, take pictures, and put it out on a friendly, you know, what do you call it? Facebook, and then everybody knows about it before he told them. <laughs> so, yeah. but he'll tell them. But that that it is, and we do like to to show the machinery. It's good to understand it, and the people who run it love, love to talk about it. So yes. Well, I was wondering because the Wool Arts Tour is coming up Columbus Day weekend, mm -hmm. and we'll go up to it. And so I just wondered whether or not that is something we could see. It's worth coming by, yeah. And we run, we have a whole program of classes. In fact, I brought some class instructions here. And uh, uh, people come for four or five days at a time. And part of their class is we introduce them to the spinning mill while they're there. I had a um, question when you're talking about the machinery and just looking around the room here. Um, I'm sure the belts can be replaced. But w when you're talking about 100-year-old machines, certainly parts have to wear out. And I'm wondering can, if you can talk about that a little bit. How do you find a part or have a part made, and what's the cost to keep a machine that's 100 years old? Running? It's painful. <laughs> 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 there was a guy in Worcester named Larry Samuels. And Larry was a kind of a crazy person and went around. When mills closed, they had parts rooms. And he would buy all their parts. And every Davis and Ferber part had a number on it. And he had a warehouse in Worcester. And I could call on the phone and say, Larry, I need a N538. Uh, I've got seven of those. I said, you got any new ones? Yep, and he'd send them to me. And it was fantastic. And now he's gone. <laughs> and all that stuff went away. So it's very difficult now. Because a, a lot of this equipment was custom made. Um, and you can't just buy a gear anywhere. So we, we hand make some of these things. We try to find them if we can. There's a mill in Sanford, Maine that closed in 1970, and it's called International Woolen. They had 50 cards, and they're still sitting there under a roof that's open, and it hasn't, the building hasn't burned down. Don't ask me why. An Italian company owned it in 1970 when they closed it. They didn't pay their taxes to the town of Sanford, Maine, and so the town locked the doors, and they have, since they have 50 frames and 50 cards, they have a lot of spare parts, enough to keep us going forever. But we can't get in to get them, and it's kind of a sad story because either the building will burn down, it's the old Bigelow Stanford Mill, 500,000 square feet, um, or it'll all go to the dump one day and nobody will 
know about it. So we're always keeping our eye on it, but we, it's a problem. And I, I got in there once to get a part for a frame, and I went into one of three parts rooms for frames, and there were brand new parts in wrappers that said Davis and Ferber right on them, and I opened them up, and they're brand new. And they'd been sitting there for 10 years at that time. Um, so it's tempting, but I don't know if we'll go get lucky. You've, you've mentioned cards a bit. Um, could you speak about what role the cards serve? Are the cards? Like, yeah, are yeah. they like Hollerith type cards or whatever became Hollerith cards? Right. The, the cards were, there are two ways to make yarn uh, out of wool. One is you can card it, and the other is you can comb it. The worsted industry is the combing industry. So they take the wool and they comb out the longest fibers. And what's left behind is called noils, N-O-I-L-S. And then the, uh, the comb part is called a top. And a top spinner, a worsted spinner, buys tops and extrudes them and turns them. They're very strong because uh, strength of yarn depends on the length of the fiber. And these are only long fibers. In a carded, if, in a carded system, the card clothing, um, the, the rollers just miss each other and they pass the wool from one roller to the next. One roller is going fast and one's going slow. And it's as though. Uh, you held a handful of wool and I ran by and grabbed a little bit of it and pulled it. And then the next person pulled a little more and it sort of cards it. And then it, it, we break it into, this is where things get really confusing, called roving in the worsted industry. And we call it roping with a P in the woolen industry. And so you have the worsted industry and the carded industry, but the carded industry is also known as the woolen industry. So you have the worsted industry and the woolen industry. But that's what the carding is all about. And uh, most uh, dense fat, if you, if you magnify a piece of uh, worsted yarn, it looks like a cable. Everything running parallel and slowly turned on itself. It's very strong and doesn't need a lot of twist. So that's what men's suits are made out of because you don't want to sit down three times and wear a hole in your pants. Um, that's what sweaters are made from because they want to be light and fluffy. A carded yarns are denser. If you magnify a carded yarn, it would look like a tube full of spaghetti. Things are kind of going in one direction, but it's more of a tangle. So they have great insulating value and great warmth value. And that's why it's used for blankets and coats, socks, things like that. That's really the difference. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm interested in how you keep people interested in the textile industry who are like younger and getting a workforce that stays around. Employees, we, we work at it all the time. Uh, we try to hire local people if we can because that's part of the preservation project is to keep working, textile working people there. Uh, we have to pay them competitive wages. Uh, Nick and, uh, has instituted a four day work week and that's really attractive to people because every weekend is a three day weekend. And he's constantly trying to come up with other ideas there are a lot of people, we, we live in an area that has a strong work ethic still. People like to know they're doing something, they like to see it piled up by the door at the end of the day, and they feel good about the product. Um, so that appeals to some people, not everybody, but it does appeal to some. I mean, I look at some of the jobs that our employees do and I think, I could never do that. I could do it for a week and then I'd go crazy. But a lot of people like to come in, do their job and go to home, go home at night and forget about it and they're pleased with what they've accomplished. So it, it's hard to judge what, what's gonna to appeal to people and what isn't. Um, but it's something you have to constantly have to work at. But we make them try to feel like they're really part of a bigger team. And I, I've never liked uh, watching people work. I can barely do my own job, I can't do theirs. So I, re I really depend on people, like quality control, for instance, everybody has to take a responsibility for quality control because they're going to see every single pound of it. I'm not going to see every pound of it. It's never going to happen. And uh, so we, we make them responsible and then we listen to them. Um, and it, it seems to work all right. We've, had, we've been very lucky in this tight labor market, although I shouldn't say this because we've just lost three people all of a sudden out of about 35. But we've, had, we've been very lucky with people staying and working there. So it's, it's been good. But like everybody, you have, to, you have to listen and you have to be paying attention. I've always believed you could never be a better company than your people. 
you know, I've been in plenty of plants where they don't pay the people well and they don't treat them well, and then they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on machinery that they understand why they can't make a good product. And it's because they're not putting the people first. I think that's what they really need to do. Anyone else? One of the things I didn't say, it sort of got at it in the film. The mills in Harrisville are small, and it took me a long time to figure out. I mean, you look at the mills here, and you think, wow, they must have been, I used to think, they must have been way smarter than we are. The mills are huge here. But actually, it's much more organic than that. Our mills are small because the river's small, and the mills here are big because the river's big. And it, it, it was directly related, like Bill Pearson was trying to say, directly related to the natural resource that was making it go. The bigger the river, the bigger the mills. Um, so I don't feel so badly about having come from an area of small mills. We had small streams. Um, hi, I, I just had a question about, I guess, what do you, you know, what do you think of in terms of the future of the industry? Or do you, you know, if, if you notice this growth during the pandemic in terms of, say, you know, teachers maybe, um, you know, being interested in these materials for their students or parents when they were home with their kids during COVID, is that something that you that you see a you know additional path forward in terms of um, just growth in general in terms of people who are interested in, in the craft or um, I guess I'm just curious what your thoughts are about that is is there have you noticed you know significant growth or interest in you mean the craft of hand weaving yeah or just in terms of yeah I mean the, the craft of hand weaving but also in terms of kind of where you see your the business going I know your son's you know right too but um, right. just curious what your thoughts. Well, that's why we make children's products to introduce them to fiber arts, because we're hoping that for every thousand children who learn how to make a potholder, two or three of them will become wanting to be a weaver when they grow up and, and get more sophisticated about what they want to do. So it's basically teaching kids where these things come from. And when the volume increased so much during COVID, I'm hoping that there will be a, a carryover from it. Um, but it's really hard to know. Um, the, we're in a digital age where kids spend almost all their time in front of a screen, and there needs to be some balance with that. And good teachers and parents who care about that stuff are aware of that, and they're looking for activity for their children to do that's tactile. And the kind of things we do fall right into that. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it has some possibility for the future. As far as commercial textiles go, I think this back to America with industry, it's not going to happen. The, the infrastructure is gone, and it's very difficult to, to do it. So I don't see that you know, happening, no matter how much the politicians would like to see it happen. I don't think we're ever going to be a manufacturing company, a country again, unfortunately. I'll just answer your question as being a Harrisville dealer. <laughs> <laughs> um, if are there are any teachers here, elementary school teachers in the room, they have a wonderful curriculum on dealing with wool with children and like that that you can contact Crystal for. It comes in a three binder and it's, it's gr just great using with kids. Okay, so that's my plug. Great. <laughs> I'm assuming most of your customers are here in the States, but I'm just curious if there are any surprises that surprises that came along where you're shipping overseas or anywhere? Yeah, well, the, the internet has that possibility. We do ship stuff overseas. Uh, we have quite a few customers in England and Germany and France, um, Korea and Japan. But uh, that, that's really where the most of the business comes from. But I, we're not heavily uh, exporting. Oh, Canada, of course. But Canada has very strange tariffs and things on the kind of things we make. I don't know why. Uh, we get a lot of complaints from Canadians, but it's really not our fault. We, we don't write their laws. They do. But we do, we do our share, I think, of foreign stuff. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you.